to you for the nice um the nice first part of the talk i'll um so uh, i'll be talking about um critical first passage percolation on cd so really just um the last case that luigi addressed on the tree um the analogous uh, problem on the integer lattice cd the usual square lattice that we know and love. Um, and I'll, I'll make some nods to the, uh, you know, the general case of first passage percolation as well, but all the new results will be in this setting. So just to uh, set notation, and I'll, you know, just make sure we're all on the same page. The model's defined by uh, taking an IID family of edge weights TE, associated to all the uh, edges E of the lattice, which are always non-negative, then this is the critical part, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. So these uh, edge weights have probability to be zero exactly equal to the critical probability for Bernoulli percolation on CD. And then last again, and uh, this is related to this nice question at the end of Luigi's talk, um, we have an assumption of a gap. So if I define I to be the smallest number um, T such that probability that an edge weight is between, strictly between zero and at most T, that probability is positive, this is positive. So we've got some delta mass of size PC at zero, and then we've got a gap to I, and then my distribution does something. Doesn't, doesn't matter what actually. Um, okay, so um, just, uh, you know, my brief nod that I promised to the usual model. So usual or typical FPP. Um, you normally don't have uh, this um, second assumption here. So indeed, typically you take um, the probability to have zero weights small. So just to, you know, to draw the difference, let me finish defining the model. Um, given any sets, subsets of the lattice, we define the passage time TAB between sets A and B to be the infimum over all lattice pads gamma from A to B of the sum of the edge weights in gamma. So this, given our realization of the environment, this defines a pseudometric. Um, uh, in the usual case of FPP, we have that T, 0x or t0 any one or you know whatever set you want to be pushing away from the origin actually is linear in the Euclidean distance. Um, so this case of the model is um, is very different just like on trees. Um, so um, uh, just to um, you know just to state the the obvious if we had slightly more mass at zero, then actually, because there are now infinite zero weight paths, um, the passage time, you know, the question of the growth rate of the passage time becomes uh, degenerate. Uh, in particular, um, the passage time from the origin to the boundary of a box of side length n uh, is um, order one. Uh, uniformly in N. So um, the question I'm going to talk about today, you could ask, you know, kind of kind of other questions, but let's just take this measure I just introduced as a um, nice coarse way of phrasing the question. So if I take the passage time 
from the origin to distance n, Euclidean distance n, I call this Tn, like, um, like in uh, Luigi's talk about the tree, and I ask, how does it grow in n? Uh, this is now back in the critical case. So the, the motivating example, and other than stating the results, uh, I'm actually going to uh, stick to this example entirely because it's much easier to talk about, um, is the case like on the tree of Bernoulli, Bernoulli passage times. Uh, one minus over v t equals one. So um, Bernoulli with um, with exactly p c fraction of zero weight edges. So so in this language, you can map um, exactly to uh, usual critical Bernoulli percolation. You can call a zero weight edge open. It's free to pass through with no cost and otherwise closed. If it has passage time one. Then um, what Tn is, is the smallest number of closed edges that we must cross to reach distance n. So um, you can think about this as a question of, you know, how, how far do we get at a cost of opening up closed edges and critical Bernoulli percolation in this case. So this is a question that has been with us since the early days of first passage percolation. Uh, in the case D equals two, this question is very well studied. Very well studied already and still getting more well studied uh, all the time. Uh, so um, it was uh, shown in the uh, 80s by Chase, Chase, and Durant. The TN grows asymptotically like log n. So, um, so um, different than the behavior on the tree, um, obviously, we'll talk about you know what you know what the tree actually will um, you know be telling us in the lattice setting. But but this growth rate uh, here is logarithmic. Uh, later in the 90s. Keston and Zhang even showed that Tn uh, has variance, which is logarithmic in N also. And they showed um, they showed a CLT actually, so the, the passage time, uh, it, its expectation is order log n, its variance is order log n, and there's a CLT on the scale. Uh, and uh, lately, with um, the advent of uh, all the modern technology on the triangular lattice of conformal invariance in SLE, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of cheating by wedging in the triangular lattice here, but I think that everyone would um, believe that the, um, the same behavior should, uh, should be true for the critical model on Z2 or on the triangular lattice. You can even compute uh, really precisely the growth rate. So actually, Tn over log n converges almost surely uh, to uh, this infimum, this uh, you know gap parameter i divided by two times square root three times pi. So this is due to um, Yao in the case of Bernoulli weights, Bernoulli site weights on the triangular lattice, and then to um, Damron, myself, and Wykit Lam um, for uh, the case of a general, um, the case of the general model with gap. So just to come back to this gap question from, from the previous talk, um, the, the point is uh, you can show with some work that um, What's happening is uh, even if you you know e even if you um, you have these general distributions asymptotically you're able to take only weights very close to the value i. Okay. 
So in, what about in higher dimensions? Um, Bernoulli percolation uh, in intermediate dimensions uh, is notoriously hard. And so there's uh, only one result here that I'm aware of, which is true for um, general d bigger than two. This is due to Lincoln Chase, also in the 90s, that Tn grows more slowly than n to the epsilon for any epsilon positive. So um, you, you have not just sublinear growth, but sub um, any power growth. I think that Keston uh, has in some notes somewhere that you can sharpen this to something like um, e to the constant uh, root log n or something like this. Uh, so you can get, you know, you can get something nice and fairly quantitative, but you know, nobody, nobody really knows the right, um, the right rate here. Um, so today, the, the new results, um, a question sure. uh, in dimension uh, greater than two at uh, tn is less than n to the epsilon, but uh, is this assuming that there is no infinite cluster at criticality or something of that sort? No, I, I mean, so if there is an infinite cluster of criticality, that only will help you. Um, then the passage time to infinity will again be order one. Um, so this, this is really using nothing. Uh, you know, it's, it's an extremely by hand uh, argument, um, using really nothing except for the fact, you know, one of the, the few nice facts we have is that you have um, uniform positive probability to have an open crossing of thin slabs uh, in 3D or whatever higher dimensions, uh, and then bootstrapping up from this. So you know that there are macroscopic zero weight clusters and you try to bootstrap up to show that you can swim up to one of these clusters without paying too much penalty. So very good. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot for the question. Um, so today um, I'm going to be talking about D-large. Um, D-large, uh, I'll state precisely what I what we actually need, Luigi and I, uh, when I state the theorem. Um, but um, let me let me just um, say that it's known due to Haran Slade and also um, uh, to Benderhofstad and Fitzner um, that um, if D is sufficiently large, so in, in the latter case. Now we know for D at least 11, that there is no percolation, as Ron said, at PC. There are no infinite um, uh, zero-way paths, almost surely. And so in particular, we have the bare fact that Tn goes to infinity uh, as n goes to infinity, almost surely. You have to keep taking uh, weight one edges. Uh, so, you know, this, this is not very quantitative, but it's, it's much more than is known in, in three dimensions, for instance, where we still don't, don't even know this fact. Um, so in, in higher dimensions as well, it's uh, uh, more um, it, through the techniques of the LACE expansion and then other works building on this, um, we have uh, in this high D regime, some um, uh, very quantitative information about the size of critical clusters. So about the open clusters uh, in, in the model. Um, so for instance, um, and this, this is important because uh, this will be the main input. This is the main output of the LACE expansion. It's the main input in you know, all, all the results. It's known for D sufficiently large that um, the probability that there's an, um, let me, so could take this opportunity to introduce the percolation notation. So the probability that there is an open connection from the origin to a site X, uh, or in other words, the probability uh, that the passage time from zero to X is zero is asymptotic to 
the norm of x to the two minus d. So this is um, this is due to several people. Um, it's due to um, it, it's due in the precise setting I'm talking about to Hara and um, and Fitzner and Van der Hofstad. Forgive me for abbreviating there. Um, there was an earlier work, um, you know, not not exactly in this setting um, uh, as well. Um, so this this gives us some information about the size of um, of critical clusters in the setting. This is now also known down to d at least eleven, um, but it should be true for d bigger than six. And indeed, it's shown for d bigger than six in the so-called spread out models, where instead of taking ZD with the usual edge set, you take edges um, that have a large but finite range. Uh, and so if you take this range to be long enough, then you can, you can show this all the way down to uh, d bigger than six. So this, this gives some hope for, um, you know, saying something quantitative uh, about, um, about the growth of the first passage time. And my main theorem today, uh, joint with Luigi, is uh, giving um, the exact leading order behavior of the first passage time in high dimensions under this assumption. So under this um, assumption from the last, the last page, maybe I should put it here. So star is that the probability that the origin is connected to X is asymptotic to X to the two minus D. So um, the results here are under this assumption star um, and um, you know, given a distribution that satisfies the three conditions I introduced in the, um, in the very beginning. Um, so again, this assumption star is known for D at least 11, but conjecturally should hold down to D bigger than six. And the reason I state it uh, conjecturally like this is that um, we observe a difference in the, um, in the uh, exact uh, behavior of Tn, depending on uh, which dimension we're in. So if D is bigger than eight, then we can show that Tn over log base two, log base two n converges almost surely to I. And if D equals seven, then there's a similar behavior. The growth rate is again, um, doubly logarithmic in N, but now the base is different. The first passage time grows like log sub three halves, log sub three halves of N times this gap I. And indeed, if, um, if I were zero here, then uh, the growth rate would actually be sub uh, double logarithmic. So, um, right. So, any questions about this? This claim. So, um, so this this kind of behavior, uh, if you um, you know, if you remember from the end of Luigi's talk, uh, the first the first um, uh, part of this result is maybe exactly what you would um, what you would believe based on the picture on trees. And in the D equals seven case, it's definitely similar, but there's some kind of correction where it seems like um, the analogy breaks down. Um, I, I should say, um, so in, in high dimensions, without trying to give, um, you know, uh, a careful, uh, careful account of this whole history. Um, for uh, high dimensions, um, there's this general uh, philosophy of quote unquote mean field behavior. Basically, um, 
large critical clusters that are sufficiently separated should have a degree of independence. And so um, a consequence of this is that some of the, um, some of the um, uh, measures of the size of large critical clusters um, uh, obey, for instance, some of the same power laws as on trees, though there are definite differences. Um, obviously, you see this uh, assumption star up here is not, um, you know, clearly not the same as for, uh, for uh, critical percolation on a tree. Um, and also, they um, tend not to change as well. So, um, you know, many of the power laws are constant for large dimensions. There, there are a couple other uh, power laws that are proved um, under star and d bigger than six, which illustrate this philosophy and also will be useful for us. Um, and, and you can see, you know, the analogies to the tree behavior. Um, so um, if I let, um, now I'm, I'm really talking about critical percolation. So I'm gonna say this in critical percolation langu language. If I denote as in Luigi's talk uh, by CX, the open cluster of a site X of the lattice, then uh, it's known First, the power law for the, um, the tail behavior of the cardinality of this cluster is known in this setting to be um, t to the minus one half, the probability of the cluster has more than two vertices. So that's, that's very tree-like. Uh, this is due to um, Eisenman-Barsky and Barsky-Eisenman respectively, uh, two, two of their papers. Um, and um, uh, illustrating some of the difference uh, with, um, with trees as well, um, similarities and difference. So the probability that the cluster has Euclidean diameter uh, bigger than R is, again, in this setting, asymptotic, hopefully, can, can you read that, R to the minus two, maybe I'll. R to the minus two. So this is due. Uh, this is due in this form to Cosma and Nakmias. There was a, a a paper of Sakai uh, before this, um, which uh, proved this under an unproven assumption. So Cosma and Nakmias are due the um, the uh, non-conditional result. So this this is different than trees. Uh, um, the power that you saw in Luigi's talk. And this is related to, again, without opening up a big can of worms, trying to, uh, you know, give too much of the story. Um, uh, so the, this is related to the fact that even if you expect some kind of, you know, vaguely tree-like behavior, whatever that means, um, these clusters are still embedded in the ambient Euclidean space. And so the intrinsic um, diameter exponent uh, is actually one, like on trees. So this is really an extrinsic exponent, um, uh, not an intrinsic exponent. Okay, so um, great. So I'm gonna use those results in what follows. Um, they're key, uh, key uh, pieces of the puzzle. But uh, also I'm gonna state another new result related to these results. Um, so, um, so um, right, so we've been talking about the growth of Tn. What about, here's, a, here's another question. Suppose we, um, so let's really consider the Bernoulli case. So that the, we're really, you know, just thinking about Bernoulli percolation. Um, and like I said, I'll uh, just keep this in mind from now on. Um, Suppose I fix an integer k, and I want to study the probability that the passage time to distance n is, let's say, less than or equal to, it's not going to matter, but it's a little cleaner, less than or equal to k as n goes to infinity for k fixed. So you can think about this as being like an extreme lower tail event for the first passage time, which we know actually wants to be diverging log-log rhythmically. Um, 
This, um, so this uh, thing from the previous slide, just to go back for a second, um, this um, probability here is usually referred to as the one arm or the arm probability. So the probability that the origin is reaching out with an arm um, of open edges of, of diameter at least r. Um, so it, you can think about by analogy to that, this probability here as being uh, the probability of an arm, uh, quote unquote, with k defects, at most k defects. So meaning we're asking for the probability that there's a very long uh, open critical connection, except we're allowed to open at most k edges along the way. So this was actually previously studied in d equals 2 um, due to Nolan. Uh, so Nolan showed um, that um, the probability, and so he, he was writing in percolation language, not like this, but um, the probability that you have an arm with at most k defects is um, in two dimensions, asymptotic to log n to the k times the probability that you have an undefected arm, the probability that you really have an open connection to distance n. Um, so in particular, on the triangular lattice, where you can um, compute this, uh, you can compute the ladder probability. So the ladder probability um, has power law n to the minus um, 5 over 48 plus little o of 1. Um, we see that you have the same power law as we take n to infinity for fixed k. We have the same exponent for all the defected arms. So um, my other new theorem for today, again, joint with Luigi, uh, is um, uh, studying um, this behavior for large D. So the behavior of the defected arm probabilities for large D under star. So. Um, so assuming this asymptotic for the connection probability that I, I told you earlier, the two to the minus d power. So here um, we see another um, change in behavior from, uh, from when d crosses uh, the value eight. So d equals, or d is at least nine, then the um, defected k arm probability is asymptotic to n to the minus two to the one minus k. So remember with um, zero defects, we had n to the minus two. So here the, the exponent is changing and obviously changing very rapidly, unlike in two dimensions. Um, I'll skip d equals seven for a second, or d equals eight rather for a second. I'll skip down to d equals seven. So if d equals seven, then we can again get the asymptotic for the arm probability uh, and it again changes as a function of the number of defects, but the change is different. So um, the power is now and our n to the minus two to the one plus k over three to the k. And in the d equals a case, we have, so without rewriting the probability, we have the same upper bound as in, um, as in the case of uh, d at least nine. Our lower bound, um, we have uh, a possible logarithmic connection or correction where the um, exact correction a priori could depend on k. And then other than that, the same power. So um, this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, again, without opening up another can of worms, you know, trying to um, 
you know, talk about mean field behavior too much, uh, you could actually perhaps expect, um, uh, perhaps expect a logarithmic correction here at this crossover between the genuinely high dimensional behavior and the non-genuinely high dimensional behavior. Uh, I think that, um, you know, perhaps I believe this is true, but I'm not confident enough that we can prove it to, to claim it. So, so great. So that's my, my other theorem with Luigi. Uh, any questions about this? I have to interpret uh, silence much more positively than I'm used to interpreting silence. So uh, I'm gonna just assume everything looks good. So, okay. Um, sorry? So far, I think it's very clear. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. So, so let's um, restrict. Just a quick question. Is it posted, uh, your result for the sake of? Uh, uh, no, it's not. Um, okay. Don't want to put any pressure. I'm just asking. <laughs> no, yeah, th thanks. Uh, yeah, no, it's um, it's uh, largely written, uh, though, um, uh, yeah, not, I, I don't think it's uh, clean enough to post yet, so. Um, no worries. Yeah, sure. Um, right, um, so let's just, as I said before, let's restrict to Bernoulli uh, from now on. And let me introduce um, so that I can, you know, describe what's actually going on in this model. The sets DK. So these are the balls in the pseudometric of um, the balls in the pseudometric of radius K. So it's the set of uh, all X, which have passage time at most K. So the set of all X that I can reach with at most um, K K closed edges. So in particular, D0 is the open cluster of the origin with this mapping from zero to open. So the real question uh, to ask ourselves is how does DK grow with K? So in, in the time that's left in the talk, I'm gonna you know, try to give you some picture of how the arguments go and um, how to control the growth of these sets. Uh, I, I'll focus on you know, the, the parts that most easily adapt from, from trees and then try to draw the, um, draw the line and in particular explain what's happening when D equals seven that makes the behavior of things uh, so different, uh, at least you know, in some sense so different. So, so like, like on trees, um, perhaps you would uh, expect to um, ask the following question. Given dk, how does dk plus one look? Uh, or, um, you know, uh, to take the simplest example, given the cluster of the origin, how does d1 look? So, um, Let's just draw an extremely rough cartoon here. So this is my interpretation of um, D0. So suppose that the stuff I drew in black here can be reached in uh, time zero from the origin. This is the open cluster of the origin. And now I've got some X out over here. Uh, let's ask ourselves, so given d0, how does x end up in d1? So um, I can find a path, so x is not in d0 here, it's a d0 here. I can find a path from x to the origin down here. It's going to have to cross one of these weight one edges uh, on the boundary of D0, this external boundary edge. So it's going to pick up passage time one from crossing this edge, and then it can make it to the origin freely on the passage time zero cluster that, that remains. So, um, so uh, conversely, Oh, well, well, right. So the, the upshot here is that this, this path gamma here, 
that X takes to the outer boundary of this, um, this D0 cluster has to consist entirely of open weight zero edges. And conversely, you see that any X that has such a connection, so there's an, uh, a weight zero path linking up to the outer boundary of this, um, this set D0, any X that has a weight zero path like this also ends up in D1. So we can find a path gamma from X to D0 union, its outer boundary, uh, which takes um, uh, only weight zero edges. Uh, and um, conditioning on the cluster uh, D0, so conditioning on all this stuff, uh, this stuff going on near the origin, um, the um, TEs out here are unbiased. We have a quote unquote free percolation. We don't need to examine any of these edge weights. So really um, I can treat this set D0 and its external boundary as being fixed for purposes of trying to attach an open path gamma like this. So um, in other words, this unbiased property, this fact that conditioning doesn't change anything outside uh, means that, um, that D1 I can think of as the open cluster of D0 union its boundary in a refreshed environment. So on trees, um, we, had, um, we had some uh, exact recursion for the growth rate of, um, you know, or the, the growth of my, uh, my uh, quote unquote infected regions, my growing balls. Um, this is the analog that you get on general ZD. Um, but um, so notice that um, while I can think about this as taking D0 and then attaching a bunch of new open clusters to it, these open clusters, uh, unlike on a tree, are going to interact. They're no longer going to be uh, independent of each other. Um, for purposes of upper bounds, and I'll, I'll briefly walk you through, um, you know, the structure of uh, the upper bound when D at least eight. Um, for upper bounds, at least when D is at least eight, then uh, this is not really so important. Uh, this is the easiest part of things. That's not so important. But for um, lower bounds and for the upper bound when D equals seven, uh, this interaction does become important. And so I'll try to, um, I'll try to explain both sides of this, uh, this coin in what follows. So, um, so suppose you wanted to upper bound D1 given D0, I'll explain this not so important, you know, why, why for uh, some of the upper bounds, the interaction is not so hard. By implementing this uh, philosophy that I, I just sketched out about how really what we're doing is attaching open clusters to this uh, D0 union its boundary in the refreshed environment. Um, so I have some vertices X, I'm attaching clusters. Um, the number of additional vertices I can pick up by attaching all of these clusters to the boundary of my uh, original set D0, this is upper bounded by a sum over vertices X like I drew here, where they're at most order D0 terms. The cluster size of um, these vertices X now in um, in an environment where I just don't 
I don't even care about um about the set d zero. So um so uh having the set d zero there for these um these clusters to avoid, having each other to avoid is not going to matter so much. Um right, so so um so uh so what do I mean? Well I know that the tail behavior of this thing, as I said earlier, is governed by power one half. And so in particular, I see that um, with high probability, there's no um, X in the sum. with the, uh, the cluster of that site X in this new environment um, being bigger than the number of terms to the two plus delta, just by taking a union bound over these terms and using this exponent. Um, but on the other hand, in expectation, so the um, expected size of the cluster of X, given that, um, this is less than or equal to d0 to the 2 plus delta is uh, bounded by something of order and most um, d0 to the uh, 1 plus delta over 2. Um, so um, uh, with high probability, this sum is going to be bounded by um, the number of terms with the number of terms times um, times uh, d zero to the let's just say one plus epsilon, so smaller uh, up to some you know something going to zero on the power. What can happen uh, at this stage is um, the cardinality grows at, mo at most um, quadratically. And again, this is um, you know tying back into um, what we see in uh, Luigi's talk. Um, here, we're just taking a union bound. We don't care about this interaction at all, and so we see that the um, the cluster grows at most quadratically. So we can induct over k, and we see in general that the cluster um, dk for any delta positive has at most two plus delta to the two plus delta to the k vertices uh, for k large. So um, once we have control over the cardinality, we can control the diameter. So um, again, back to this picture where we've got DK, and now we're welding on clusters um, of vertices X um, attaching to it. So if um, R is much larger than the diameter of DK, again, by using this picture, uh, it's, um, it's not so hard to see that um, the um, probability, well, um, why don't I not say it like that? So let me go back to drawing. So um, um, yeah, the probability that the diameter of dk plus one is bigger than t given the region dk is um, bounded above by again, taking a union bound, the number of vertices uh, in DK or on its boundary, uh, so in most constant times cardinality of DK times the probability for any fixed X that the diameter of the cluster of X is bigger than, let's say, T over two. And by the arm exponent that we know, this is the most constant decay 
times t to the minus two. So we see similarly to before, if t is bigger than um, uh, square root cardinality dk, um, then uh, this will also go to zero. T is much bigger than this cardinality. And so we see um, that we can get control on the diameter of um, the infected region dk uh, by, um, uh, by the um, control on the cardinality. So uh, in particular, with high probability inducting, um, the diameter of dk is smaller than, again, uh, 2 plus delta to the 2 plus delta to the k for a k large. So like I say, this is, you know, like the easy upper bound part. Um, right, any questions so far? I guess, uh, how long should I go actually? Five or 10 more minutes? I, th I think you have five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. Okay. Great. So, um, great. So, um, just to, you know, to to state the obvious. So, Tn is the, um, it's the smallest k such that um, dk reaches the boundary of the box of psi length n, and so from this from this behavior we get that Tn from the behavior of the diameter of dk that we just established, we get the Tn uh, under, under these assumptions. So under the, uh, under the assumption star and for d bigger than six, Tn is at most um, uh, one plus O of one, here I'm in the Bernoulli setting, log two, log two of n, right. So, um, Right, so what's, um, what's worth stating here, uh, again, is that this is, you know, um, this result, uh, this part of the argument, this actually will work for any d bigger than six. Um, and so um, uh, you can say, well, you know, at least for the purpose of the upper bound, the interactions don't matter too much, but, um, but I claimed earlier in a, in a theorem that they do in d equals seven. So I should try to explain to you what's different when d equals seven. And then um, I can just say that recovering enough independence for uh, the lower bound is actually where most of the work of the argument comes. So uh, I'm showing you kind of like the, um, you know, the most easily, um, you know, stated part, part of uh, the results. So, um, Let's move to d equals seven. So why would you expect different behavior um, when d equals seven? Um, so let's... Um, sorry, there's a question about whether Tn should be bigger or equal than, rather than less or equal than. Oh, uh, yeah, um, right, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I got my uh, inequalities reversed. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, we're, we're upper bounding the rate at which it grows, so we're lower bounding the passage time. Thank you. Yeah, um, so, so what could you expect to be different um, when d equals seven? So I'm, I'm going to speak kind of very, um, very uh, top level, I guess you could say. Uh, so um, suppose I have my um, my uh, infected or um, my ball dk. Um, I know its diameter is roughly order n, um, and suppose I want to um, control, you know, the um, the growth of this thing, uh, in particular, the probability that it reaches. So when I glue new clusters onto the boundary of this, that my new region reaches distance t. Um, so um, 
just to uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, state what's going on when D is at least eight, uh, very in passing so that, um, so that, um, so that I have a point of comparison, even though, like I said, I, I don't want to really get into the details of that proof. So it, for, um, for the argument I just gave, I gave a union bound showing that DK could grow at most a certain rate. Um, when D is at least eight, what we want to do is reverse the previous union bound by recovering independence. And like I said, that's where most of the work actually comes. Uh, so showing that, you know, up to little o's and the exponent, then the union bound that I gave previously was actually sharp. So imagine that we try to do this uh, in 7D, so uh, on Z7. For uh, the cluster of the origin, or sorry, for us to glue a cluster on, that reaches um, diameter t, so this is some um, cx. Um, this cluster cx, as it passes from the set dk in the box of side length n to the uh, to distance t very far away, uh, cx must be a spanning cluster, quote unquote spanning cluster of um, this annulus. So the annulus from the box of side length n to the box of side length 2n. Uh, so I, I just mean open cluster that touches both the inside and the outside of this annulus. So there's a paper uh, of Eisenman in the 90s where um, he says quite a lot about spanning clusters both in two dimensions and in high dimensions, but part of the upshot of this paper is that in high dimensions, we have order n to the d minus six spanning clusters. So we want to um, have a CX that extends like this. This CX must be one of these order n spanning clusters. Um, and then, so after the cluster CX, um, so CX must span and then reach distance T. So um, let's just, um, let's just speak very heuristically about this. So um, we have a total of um, n spanning clusters when d equals seven. What's the conditional probability? Um, so when I say conditional, I mean given that a particular cluster spans, what's the conditional probability that it reaches distance t after it spans uh, this annulus? Well, by this one arm probability I talked about earlier, so the unconditional probability should be order t to the minus two. But then if I know that the cluster spans the annulus, I'm conditioning on, event, on an event of probability order n to the minus two. So I expect that this will have, um, um, wait, sorry. Uh, no, yeah, this, this is right. Yeah, so um, n squared t to the minus two. Uh, so this this is the order of the probability that a particular cluster, uh, particular spanning cluster makes it further. So if we take a union bound, then the probability that there exists such a spanning cluster, which furthermore reaches distance t, since I have n spanning clusters, and I have this probability is n cubed t to the minus two. And this goes to zero um, if t is bigger than n uh, to the three halves. So we see that uh, instead of the diameter squaring, 
it can at most grow by exponent three halves, at least very heuristically here. So this is this is really the difference in um, in uh, in uh, dimension seven that actually you just don't have enough room to recover enough independence to run this argument outward. Um, you're trying to fit that many clusters attaching uh, to your region DK to get enough independent trials is just not possible. So um, yeah, maybe I should stop here uh, since I'm out of time and uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Jack, for the wonderful talk. Um, do we have any questions? Um, Jack? Um, perhaps uh, you can say something about the lower bounds. Uh, how do you show saying they meant in large dimension bigger than eight that uh, the, the upper bound is somewhat sharp? Sure, sure. Um, so um, yeah, so let's let's again um, so so suppose we want to show that um, that uh, let's say D1, uh, the set of stuff reachable by crossing one closed edge is big uh, given, um, given, uh, given D0. So, and let's even assume that D0 is kind of large uh, for purpose of making the argument uh, easier. Um, so um, the upper bound that I, I said earlier, that was really a bound on, um, on uh, expectation. So um, I had an upper bound on um, the uh, expected number of x where I'm trying to attach a cluster such that um, the cardinality of Cx is bigger than um, uh, d0 squared. Right, so that that's really uh, an upper and lower bound. So um, if I put say two minus delta here, then um, just by using this cluster size tail uh, that I have, you know, the expectation is just linear. So um, that reverse is just fine. So um, what what I want to do is uh, show that this uh, expectation is really the right order for the number of such. Um, the number of such uh, x that have uh, you know this many vertices that they're able to attach to roughly quadratic. Um, so uh, the way that we do this is by a second moment argument controlling the variance, um, not totally dissimilar to what Luigi talked about on trees. Um, I can say uh, you know just to kind of like draw you to the highlight part of this, uh, you would expect that. Um, that the union bound would be sharp if um, for different different vertices x and y, cx and cy are roughly independent. Uh, as a proxy for that, we could take, you know, with um, some, some abuse, let's say that we believe we can get some independence using, uh, you know, correlation inequality, say, uh, if um, we know that the clusters uh, are disjoint. So um, suppose I wanted to compute the expected number of vertices y um, such that um, cy uh, intersect cx is empty um, for x and y as here, and let's say given that um, the diameter of CX is large as up here. So this would give me uh, sum over Y in D0 um, uh, probability Y in CX given, uh, given this event. Um, now in four dimensions, part of this, or sorry, in high dimensions, D bigger than six, part of this whole philosophy I was talking about before is that open clusters are uh, roughly four dimensional. 
So uh, large open clusters are roughly four dimensional. So if I'm conditioning CX to be large, then near Y, it should look roughly four dimensional. So this sum, this probability here should be like Y minus X to the four minus D. And then this sum here um, is also over D zero, which is a large open cluster. And so again, is four dimensional. So I'm getting a power that's like uh, eight minus D here. Um, so you see that if D is at least eight, then um, you know, this, this contribution should not be too large. This will, you know, this, this is more or less what arises in compu computing the second moment. This, this will not give you something very large. Whereas um, if, uh, if D is smaller then you start to see, uh, you know, start to see this build up. So I hope this I hope this gives you enough idea. Basically, what we have to do is inductively control um, dk uh, at uh, all scales. So for all k to show that it retains enough four dimensionality to make this bound work. Because I know that d zero obeys all the things that critical clusters obey. But you know, once I start attaching stuff to it, I need to make sure that I don't end up with some kind of you know more complicated looking five dimensional objects. So. Uh, I, I see Jack, thank you very much. Yeah, very thank you, John. Thank you. Any, any other question maybe? There okay. was another question in the, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, oh yes, Tyler, right? Yeah. Um, Tyler, do you want to, should I unmute your? Okay, let me try to do that so that you can, uh, Let's see. Yes. Um, yeah, you can, you can. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Hi. I think I'm back to being unmuted now. Okay. Uh, so maybe a naive question, but when there is no gap, can you say something using the lattice tree results in high enough dimensions, like nine and higher? Yeah. So um, I would believe that we could probably say something, but I'm, I'm not actually sure what we could say. Um, uh, we haven't really like tried to sit down and sharpen that part of it yet, um, which is something that, you know, I think we'd like to do before we actually post. Um, so it's a good question. One thing that you can do uh, that's not so hard even, uh, and this is analogous to what happens in two dimensions, you can construct uh, distributions that have finite passage time to infinity. If you just take the tail uh, at zero, so if there's no gap and then uh, all the mass of the distributions way bunched up at zero, then, um, then uh, you can uh, proceed out to infinity along a sequence of closed edges whose weights are decreasing so fast um, uh, that, um, that you have finite passage time to infinity. And in, in two dimensions, the line here is actually, um, the line is actually explicit. We know exactly for what distributions that happens. That's a result of Damron, uh, Lam, and Wang. Um, so we would, uh, I think we would like to do something like this in high dimensions. It seems a little touchier um, than in 2D, but, um, uh, but you know, maybe, maybe it can be done, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I don't think there were there was any more questions in, in the chat. So maybe I can just unmute everyone for five seconds so we can thanks uh, Jack and actually both both speaker again. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.